Good morning. You can hear me. Good, good. I um looking forward to this. I'm a little stuffy, so um been stuffy for four weeks. So I'm not hopefully this mic will work. Maybe I'll switch if if it feels like I'm Darth Vader or something like that. But um Good. This morning, like Tracy said, we're going to continue in the series of I am, uh, the I am statements that Jesus made in the John, the book of John. And um, I, I love the I am statements. I, I, I preached through the I am statements during COVID with the youth. Um, because, you know, in a, in a, in a, why listen to everybody's opinion about Jesus when you can just go to Jesus to find out what he says about himself? You know, honestly, why not go to Jesus and see, see what he says? So that's, I think that's what, we are, that's, that's what we're doing in this series is ultimately what is Jesus saying about himself that allows us to see him revealed in our hearts. Because as we're going to talk about today and as I'm going to talk about for the rest of my life, it's all about him. It's truly all about him as we sang this morning. Help me to never gain a something, a reward. I don't know the lyrics. A crown. I knew it was something like that. Because it's all about him. So we're going to explore this morning. I think it's, in my opinion, um, maybe it's because I'm the one doing it, but I think I Am the Gate is one of the more difficult ones. Um, and, you know, I think it might be one of the more lesser known ones, but... Jesus says in John chapter 10, he says, I'm the gate. Some translations say, I am the door. So, you know, I'll use that interchangeably this morning because it is what it is. But why don't we stand together? Let me pray. If you can stand with me. Father, this morning, you are so, so good. Father, without your spirit, we are nothing. Father, without your spirit, we are helpless and hopeless. We are just a people traveling around trying to find ourselves, but it's through you, Lord, that we might find new life and life everlasting. So, Father, this morning, uh, I just ask that you reveal yourselves through the pages of your book, through the through the words that you've spoke and you've um, wrote through your Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1961, during the Cold War, the Berlin Wall was constructed by East Germany, known as the German Democratic Republic. Its primary purpose was to keep people from going to West Germany, which was a more democratic area. German people wanted more freedom and economic opportunities that were not given in the communist East Germany. This wall was physically constructed, which divided the city of Berlin which was symbolizing the Cold War's division between the communist Eastern Bloc and the democratic Western Bloc. Families and friends were separated, and countless attempts to cross the wall resulted in a tragic consequence. 
on November 9th, not very long ago, 10 days ago, November 9th in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, marking a historic moment in the end of the Cold War. East Germans were now allowed to cross into the West. The reunification of East and West Germany followed. This symbolized the end of the Cold War and the unification of Germany as one single democratic nation. What was built in 1961 is not just a story for us to read now, in my opinion. It actually provides an insight into Jesus' I am statement, I am the gate. It's inviting us to consider the walls within our hearts and within our spirit that separates us from the abundant life that he's inviting us into. The fall of the Berlin Wall serves as this metaphor for the transformational power of Jesus, the gate. Now let's read. Let's go to John chapter 10, verse 1. I have it on the screen, but let's stand for the, I just like standing today. I'm, I'm in the mood. Can you read, just read this with me. We're going to read this together. Um, so it says, very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes to only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen. You can sit down. Growing up in a school system here on the island, and as much as I might not seem it, and much as it's, you know, it's a social standard, I was a part of the popular kids in school. I was like l the last that they thought. I was actually the leader. No, I'm just joking. But, uh, but I was the popular kids in school in some w different ways. So there was actually a lot of different doors that I could find myself walking through um, growing up. One of the doors being the door of self-pleasure needing to prove to my friends and schoolmates that I was cool. Willing to throw away everything I learned in scripture, in youth group, in church, so that I could have something, a cool story to tell my friends at the next party. If you didn't have a story to tell when hanging out with your friends, you'd be, you might have felt rejected, labeled, uncool. One of the doors I might have fell in was the door of drinking and partying, witnessing my friends commit their weekends and holidays to getting absolutely plastered and partying their lives away. One of the doors might have been the door of busyness, no time for the important things in life. Unable to say no for the possible fear of being rejected. The door of priorities. Deciding that racing for last place in hockey was more important than my spiritual journey. Siding with what friends think 
over being in a community with young people at youth group on the same journey to know Jesus. Church, I'm happy that I didn't have parents who just wanted to be my friend. I think now we're only kind of being friends a little bit. We'll see. Depends on the day. Um, even though I made mistakes, they made Jesus a priority in my life when, even when I didn't, they didn't give me an option to miss out on church. We have too many parents trying to get their kids somewhere else, forgetting that salvation is on the line. Your hockey team, your basketball team, your chess club won't grow your child's faith. What will help is Jesus Christ and experiencing him with other believers. Anyone who says they don't need to go to church to love Jesus does not love Jesus. Anyone who says that, I don't think that landed very well. Let me say it again for the Anyone who says they don't need to go to church and claims to love Jesus, Jesus but dislikes the church does not love Jesus. Jesus is represented through the body of believers. He calls the church his bride. He is the bridegroom. That would be like me telling Jack, Jack, I love you, but I hate your wife. How would that go over? Jesus, I love you, but I hate your bride. I'm sure Jack wouldn't like that very much. Parents, you have a responsibility for your child's spiritual journey. Proverbs tells us, tells you, I don't have kids, <laughs> tells you to train up a child for the way that they should go. I'm thankful for my time in kids' church. It rooted me in scriptures and allowed me to understand the importance of being in community, even though I didn't understand it. Friends, how can your child find godly mentors when they're never in a place with godly people? How can your teenagers be good, build good, solid Christian friendships when they are never in a place with other Christians? Friends, it's time to take a discipleship seriously. It's time to get into the word of God. It's time to know Jesus. It's time to find the love of Jesus and to love him back. I did a survey a few months ago at youth group with the teens in our church. One of the questions I was asking was about their family and what, what it, they did when it came to reading the Bible and praying. Only 6.8% of teens that took the quiz... It was 2014. Only 6.8% said that they read their Bible with their family or pray at home together as a family. 6.8%. It's time to take responsibility for your and your child's journey. That doesn't mean you take responsibility for the rest of their lives. But that t means you take responsibility for when they're under the, your care. You give them the best hope. The reality is that many of us have entered many doors. Even some of us right now are being tempted by, the, by doors that promise us life, that will promise us gain or success, that will promise us pleasure. They might even promise us hope, but ultimately at the end, those doors will lead us to death. Here's the truth. There are only two doors, a door that leads to life and a door that will lead to death. The door of death will present itself in many different ways, in many different doors, with its goal to try to lure, to try to please, to try to bring you gratification. But in the end, it will lead to death and destruction. The Apostle John tells us in 1 John, do not love the world or the things in the world. Anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world. The desires of the flesh 
and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world, and the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Friends, even the book of James tells us, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Church, the door of life is one door. It's one way. It's one man. His name is Jesus Christ, the King of kings, Yahweh I am. What door do you find yourself pursuing today? What door do you find yourself entering in most days? Is it the door of death, the ways of the world? Or is it the door of life? I just want to give you a little bit of background of what's going on in the book of John leading up to John chapter 10. In John chapter 8, we have this dialogue that Jesus has with these two groups of Jews. You have the Jews that believe and follow Jesus. Then you have the Jews who don't believe it and don't follow Jesus. Jesus says to the Jews who follow him in John chapter 8, 31, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This dialogue between these two sets up this conflict that the Jews has with Jesus. They look at Jesus and they say, well, what do you mean the truth will set us free? We're not being held captive by anyone. Our father is God. We come by father Abraham. So Jesus says to them in John 8, 42, he says, if God was your father, if, if God were your father, you would love me. For I've come here from God. I've not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Just imagine what's going on in the hearts of these Jewish people. Jesus says, you're not following your father. You're not following the father that you think you're following. He says, you're actually following your father, the devil. And a little bit further in the text, Jesus says, before Abraham even was, I am. Then we move into chapter 9 where we see Jesus encounter this blind man, this man was born blind since birth, and to summarize, Jesus heals this man, and the city goes crazy. They go so crazy that they take this blind man to see the Pharisees, say, and they say, how can it be that this man, who we know was blind, we know it because we walk by him every day. We know he was blind. How can it be? That he can see now. How is that possible? So the Pharisees go to the blind man. They ask him, how can you see? What happened that you can see? And this blind man testifies about this man named Jesus who spit on the ground, made blood, put it in the, his, his, his eye and told him to go wash it in the pool. The Pharisees are upset. They're angry. This blind man is healed, and not only are they upset about that, they're upset that it was Jesus that healed them. The Pharisees are so upset because this blind man was healed and that it was Jesus that healed them that they excommunicated the blind man. They exiled the blind man out of the community of the Jewish people. They rejected him. He's no longer a part of this Jewish community because he testified that Jesus had healed him. So we see that the Pharisees are angry because Jesus is doing something that they did not like. 
So then we move into John chapter 10, and this is not a new scenario. This is not a new conversation. This is the same event taking place. This is actually just a continuation of the event we just read. When they put the Bible together, they did not have chapters and verses like we had originally, like we have today. So John chapter 9, John chapter 10, they actually just flow together. So we're caught up. We understand the background on why Jesus was saying these things in Scripture this morning. So we see in John chapter 10, verse 1 to 7, that the Jews did not understand the meaning of the story of the Good Shepherd. So Jesus plainly and without holding back applied the story to himself. And he began by saying, I am the door. In this parable, Jesus spoke about two kinds of sheepfolds. In the villages and in the towns themselves, there was these common sheepfolds um, where, where shepherds would bring their flocks and they were sheltered when they returned home at night. These sheepfolds were protected by a strong door of which the guardian of the door held the key. So it was kind of the, that was the kind of sheepfold that Jesus refers to himself in in verse 2 and 3. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. But when the sheep were out in the hills in the warm season, they did not return at night to the village. They were collected in sheepfolds on the hillside with an opening, uh, as you can see there, with an opening which the sheep came in and went out. But there was no door of any kind. What happened at night was the shepherd himself would lie down across the opening so no sheep could get in and out except over his body. In the most literal sense, in the most literal sense, the shepherd himself was the door. That through him and through him alone, people found access to the sheep. The sheep found access to the outside. And so Jesus refers to himself that way when he says, I am the door. Ephesians 2 says this, through him we have access to the Father. Jesus opens the way to God. Until Jesus came, men could only think of God as a, at best a stranger and at worst an enemy. But Jesus came to show people what God was like and to open a way to him. He is the door to people alone people alone enter to God. Jesus actually uses the imagery of a gate in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. My question for you this morning is, why does Jesus use the imagery of a gate or a door? Why, what is Jesus trying to communicate with these statements? I believe it's this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. And the kingdom of God is exclusive. Let me be, explain them here. Because I think some of you might have been offended what I just said. Um, let me break it down into two sections. First off, the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. In Romans 5, 8 and 9, it says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, we live in a culture where the idea of sin is minimalized. There are churches today that say there's no such thing as sin. That once you accept Jesus as Lord, you become sinless. And this is false. There is nowhere in Scripture where it says you become sinless. We just read that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not about me. It's about him. Through my own willpower, through my own strength, I cannot be made righteous. It all has to do with him. 
It's his blood that covers my sin. I still sin every day. I still don't listen to his voice every day. Every time I gratify what the flesh and the world desires, I am sinning against God. But here's the thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ, as the gospel of Jesus Christ begins to transform my life, I experience the love of Jesus more and more in my life. Let me tell you, it becomes easier to submit my life to the one. I begin to detest the sin in my life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to every part of my human nature. It's offensive to every part of your human condition. There's a reason why Jesus said you have to die to yourself. You have to take up your cross and follow him. Friends, the gospel... If the gospel of Jesus Christ is not offending you in your life, you don't have the true gospel. If the gospel of Jesus Christ is not offending you in your life, you don't have the true gospel. The true gospel requires something of me. It requires sacrifice. It requires my life to be an altar for the Lord. That as I begin to understand the gospel and what Jesus did for me, why would I entertain anything in my life that contradicts what he has said and what he wants in my life? The second part, the kingdom of God is exclusive. It's been fashionable for some time to affirm that all religions are beautiful and true, each in their own way. I've actually heard people say stuff to me like, I believe what you, I believe what I believe, that's good for me. You believe what you believe, that's good for you. And this notion has even crept into the church. It has become doctrine in some churches in the West. And Christians fear of being thought of a bigot or unkind when we are reluctant, to, when we say that Jesus Christ is the one and only way to true life and truth. Telling the truth is difficult in a culture that rejects the very idea of truth as a fixed, universal, objective, absolute. Some say religions are true. Many, even in my generation, say Jesus may be your truth but not another person's. As long as you believe something sincerely, it's true for you. Friends, there's a pretty obvious problem with this. And it raises the questions, could all religions be true? So I put an actual chart together with five of the biggest religions in the world, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And let me ask you this question, could all of these religions be true? Buddhists don't believe in a personal God. Many are atheists. Hindus believe in many gods. In fact, 330 million gods. Jews believe in one God, Yahweh. Islam believes in one God, Allah. Christians believe in one God who exists in three persons. Let's look at what they believe about salvation. Buddhists believe through enlightenment. Hindus believe through incarnation. The Jews believe through the law. Islam believes in five pillars. Christianity believes in salvation through grace. So if it's by the law, it can't be by the grace. If it's by the grace, it can't be by the law. All these religions can be false, but they can't all be true. Friends, Jesus didn't say, I am one way, one truth, and one life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Some will say, I'll follow Jesus' teachings as a moral teacher, but I will not follow him as king or as the son of God. Well, then you're not following Jesus because in the idea, in the marketplace of ideas, Jesus is either a lunatic, an awful strange person. He's either a, a, a liar or a deceiver trying to deceive the people that follow him. Or Jesus is either who he says he is. Taking Jesus' teachings as a moral standard is not an option because you either take him as he is or you don't take him. 
I said this earlier, there are only two choices, a choice to follow the road and enter through the gate that leads to death and destruction, or to follow the road and enter through the gate that leads to life and life everlasting. I don't want to spend a lot more time on the idea of Christianity being exclusive because there's probably an I am statement that might deal with that down the road in John 14, so we'll look at that later. But my point for this is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to our human condition, and the kingdom of God is exclusive. And I'm using that to frame what Jesus is saying, that you, everybody, at every some point in life, they will have to make a choice. Will they enter or will they not? Jesus is inviting us into something deeper. Following Jesus is much more than just a bunch of rules and a ticket to eternal life. We're actually invited to journey with Christ, to be an inter- in an intimate relationship with him. We are invited to find the love of Jesus and to light him back and love him back. And ultimately, that is the point of Christianity, to find the love of Jesus. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will open to be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks on the door, it will be open. Jesus is inviting us into something deeper. It's not enough to just come to church on a Sunday, go through the motions, get through worship, get through the message, have some coffee, and go home and live the way you want for the rest of the six days. In John 10, Jesus is inviting us into something deeper. He says, those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastors. When the Berlin Wall fell, the people of East Berlin were united with the West. They found this new freedom. They found this new life that I'm sure many of them, while the wall was still up, thought they might never see their family and friends on the other side again. I don't believe that entering through the gate that Jesus is talking about is a one and done thing. I believe that it's a choice that we must make every single day. I'm going to say something here that might offend some people. So there's my warning. And this is my opinion. All right? So go easy on Tracy if you don't agree. Actually, no, go to Tracy if you don't agree. I'm just joking. Um, The sinner's prayer has sent more people to hell than anything else in the church. We have, the church in the West have done people wrong by making that the minimum entry to the kingdom. It's about a relationship with him. It's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about him. We've made Jesus into this puny little savior that it seems like he's just begging for us to accept him. In fact, we should be begging for him to accept us. If you get to heaven and Peter asks you at the gate why you let him in and you say, oh, I said this prayer, then you've missed the whole point. We've made it about ourselves. We've accepted this me-centric gospel. I see now and then this woman in the States on Instagram that will go to different churches and do reviews and post them so people can find a comfortable place. Or some people look for a church that celebrates them. And I don't know about you. But I'd rather attend a church that celebrates Jesus. I'd rather attend a church that celebrates the words on this page. I would rather attend a church that doesn't sell themselves out. On, uh, doesn't sell themselves sh- out just to keep paychecks and butts in the seat. Because it has nothing to do with us. Peter says this, blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It's his great mercy. It's according to his. It doesn't say according to your Bible studies. 
It doesn't say according to your church attend, uh, attendance. They will not get you into heaven because they didn't buy you to start with. The only thing that will get you into eternal life is the person who paid the price for you. He's the gatekeeper. He's the shepherd. We can't do it. How many of you know that sheep are pretty dumb animals? They just follow the movement. In fact, in history, in 2005, 500 sheep fell off the cliff in Turkey because they just followed one another. Like, it's like, oh, he, uh, he's having fun. Oh, look, a ride. Sheep are dumb animals, and yet Jesus calls us sheep. Huh. That's offensive. It's in our human condition to follow culture. But let me give you a little bit of hope this morning. When we enter through the gate of life, Jesus will bring illumination to our lives. When we decide to make the choice, we decide to enter through the gate daily, Jesus will bring illumination to our lives. When we begin to submit our lives, we begin to die to ourselves that we can be raised to life with Jesus, our Lord. He says this, remember, the gate opens, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, the shepherd Listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out, all, brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow, his, follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. If I understand the gate of life, I begin to know the gatekeeper. And I, if I begin to know the gatekeeper, I begin to know the shepherd. The one whose voice I listen to. The one whose voice I will follow as he goes ahead of me. Isn't it beautiful how it says he will go ahead? That since I know his voice, I won't follow a stranger. Not even follow, but I'm going to run away from a stranger's voice. Jesus says, I am, says the I am statement that he is the gate it's a statement with an invitation to know him deeper. It's an invitation for us to submit our lives to him, to submit our wills, to submit our desires, to submit our finances, our wants, our lives, to submit our sexuality, our family, that we, when, that we can know him deeper because, friends, ultimately knowing the Savior, knowing the King of Kings, Knowing the Lord of Lords, knowing Jesus Christ personally is the only way to receive eternal life. Jesus even says it in Matthew chapter 7. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on this day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your, in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then he will tell him plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Let me tell you something because I care about you. You can know Jesus. You can know his love. You can know his grace. You can know his mercy. He died hanging on a cross for you so that you can be forgiven and live with him in eternity in a relationship with him. That's why I give him my all. That's why I want to read the words on this page. That's why I try and do my best to listen to his voice because he is the door. He's the gate. He's the good shepherd. The book of James tells us this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The psalmist says this in chapter 69, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory because of your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I shall live, as long as I live. 
In your name I will lift my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will be praised, will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate in you in the watches of the night. You have been my help and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for you. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Friends, Jesus is calling us into something deeper. He's calling us into something more. It's through him and him alone. But we live in a culture where we carry these things with us, thinking it will fix it. If I do this, I'll be happy. If I sleep with this person, maybe I'll be happy. If I have one more drink, maybe if I have one more smoke, maybe if I attend more, one more church function, there we go. Maybe if I go to one more course, maybe if I do, it's, maybe it's something you don't even know about. Maybe you have a door that you're looking for popularity, looking for acceptance, looking for a place to fit in. Maybe there are things in your life you have places and idol that share the throne of your heart. Maybe it's this. A cell phone, social media, getting a good grade. It could be anything. But Jesus says this, I have come to give you life and to give it to you in the full. How do we get this life that Jesus is promising us? We have to lay that life down. We have to lay the life down we are living now. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You are a new creation. Jesus says that he came so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The Greek phrase using it, used for having it more abundantly means to have a super abundance of a thing. To be a follower of Jesus, to know who he is and what he means is to hap- have a super abundance of a thing. Heather, if you can come up. William Barclay in his commentary on John chapter 10 says this. A Roman soldier came to Julius Caesar with a request for permission to commit suicide. He was a wrench, dispirited creature with no vitality. Caesar looked at him and said, man, were you ever really alive? When we try to live our own lives, this life is a dull, dispirited thing. But when we walk with Jesus, there comes new, a new vitality, a super abundance of life. It is only when we live with Christ that life becomes worth living. And we begin to live, a, the re, live in the real sense of this world. Even C.S. Lewis says this. Uh, the Christian says creatures are born with desires unless satisfaction, satisfaction for those desires exist. A baby feels hunger while there is such thing as food. A duckling wants to swim where there is such thing as water. Men feel sexual desire where there's this thing called sex. If I find myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Friends, this morning, what is holding you back from the entrance to the gate? What desires, what idols do you need to let go so that you can enter through the gate of life and be led by the good shepherd who promises to give you life and to give it life to you more abundantly. Who wants more abundance this morning? Is, that it? Is it just me? I don't know. Who wants more abundance this morning? Well, there's 10%. Right, we'll go with that. I believe the Holy Spirit this morning wants to fill people up. Because it's only through his presence that we can do anything. It's through his presence that chains are broken. It's through his name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord. My question for you this morning is what do you have to lie down so that you can enter through the gate? That you can accept the invitation to abundant life with God.